My name is Amanda Esco, and I am the Director of the Religious Education Program here at the First Unitarian Church of Salt Lake City. Thank you for joining us today. We have walked into October, and we have a new theme. The theme for October is longing. What is your heart longing for? This is a question that we're going to revisit throughout the month, so keep it mulling about in your brain. Do you have a chalice at home? Let's start off by lighting it. Go grab it. We're going to set, add the intention today of love with our action of service. We light this chalice for love in the spirit of service to our community. We gather in community to learn, to grow, to serve. Well, October brings us a brand new theme, and I'm so excited to share it with you. Um, we're going to explore this in multiple ways, but first, I have an announcement. We're having another outdoor movie on October 22nd. Please join us. We're going to watch The Nightmare Before Christmas. We had so much fun in September watching The Princess Bride. We want to do it one more time in October before it gets too cold. Also, I'm looking for help. We're hoping to have a Halloween celebration on Halloween, but I need help. If you can email me at dre at slcuu, that would be such a blessing. All right, onward. Let's take some deep breaths together as we settle in. So get your feet planted where they feel best. We're gonna breathe in through our nose, out through our mouth. We're gonna do this three times to ground ourselves in this space today. You ready? Deep breath in through our nose. And out. Two more times. Deep breath in through your nose. One last time. Deep breath in through our nose. Finding spiritual practices to engage in daily helps us ground ourselves in our lives so we're better able to hear what's on our hearts. So we can add that listening to hear what our heart is longing for. See what I did there? All right, another spiritual practice that we enjoy here at First Church is sharing our joys and concerns. What is going well with you? What maybe isn't? Share with the people that love you the best, and I'll be right here waiting for you when you're done. Thank you for sharing your joys and concerns. Now, Blissa is going to share with us a local UU of the week. Thank you, Lissa. Hi, I'm Lissa Lander, the Religious Education Assistant at the First Unitarian Church of Salt Lake City. Our newest UU of the week, Cyrus Edwin Dallin, was a sculptor, a painter, and an Olympic archer. <laughs> Locally, he is most famous for sculpting a statue of the angel Moroni for the Salt Lake Temple of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Cyrus Edwin Dallin was born in Springville, Utah in 1861. At the age of 19, he moved to Boston to study sculpture. While he was there, in the heart of Unitarianism in America, Cyrus Dallin converted and became a Unitarian. Dallin submitted a design for a statue of Paul Revere, which would stand in the north end of Boston. He was awarded the contract in 1883, but it took until 1940 for it to be completed. In the meantime, Dallin continued to study in fancy places like Paris and to make sculptures which are still scattered across America. 
Many are right here in Utah because he was born here, after all. Among the most famous is, of course, the angel Moroni, which stood atop the Salt Lake LDS temple since 1893. Cyrus Dallin had left the LDS church before they asked him to sculpt Moroni, so he almost said no. But sometimes art calls and pays money. <laughs> Dallin said that, quote, my angel Moroni brought me nearer to God than anything I ever did. The statue of Moroni is 12 feet tall and made of copper and covered in gold leaf. It stood as a beautiful symbol of the LDS Church until the great earthquake of 2020 caused Moroni to drop his trumpet. It was taken down for repairs. Cyrus also sculpted a four-piece series on Native Americans called the Epic of the Indian. One of them, called Appeal to the Great Spirit, became an icon of American art and is Dallin's most famous piece. The full-size ver version was cast in bronze in Paris and won a gold medal at the 1909 Paris Salon. It still stands outside the main entrance of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts today. And smaller versions of the work are in numerous American museums and in the permanent collection at the White House. This guy really made an impact on America and on art. So Cyrus Dallin is a talented artist from what was called the Territory of Utah at the time. He captured American history and religious symbols in metal, and he also captured notor notoriety and praise in America and beyond. We are excited to name him our newest Unitarian of the Week and look forward to Moroni's triumphant return. Until next time, you can learn about more fascinating Unitarian Universalists of the Week on uuoftheweek.org. Well, it's October, which means we have a new monthly theme. The theme for October is longing. We're going to look all month at the ways that our souls long for different things. Let's check out our Wonder Box to see if it has anything in it to help us start to think about this month's new theme. Ho ho, look, inside there is a U and a U. We talk a lot about being U to U or Unitarian Universalist. What we don't sometimes talk about, though, is what has made up being Unitarian Universalist, Unitarian, and Universalism. Before the merger in 1961 to create Unitarian Universalism, they were two separate denominations. Greta Anderson describes it this way, as if we're imagining a family tree. The family tree of Unitarian Universalism was watered by various streams of thought and belief. Unitarianism holds that God is one. Universalism holds that everyone is saved, not just a certain group of people. These are the two major streams of thought. But there are others. There are Eastern and pantheist traditions. These sources fed the writings of figures such as Emerson and Thoreau. More recently, there are neo-pagan streams that can awaken our senses to the natural world and atheist streams which can ground our thinking and rationality. All of our sources keep the tradition alive and organic, ever-growing, ever-changing. Today, I want us to talk about universalism, where it came from, where it's going, and how it fits into the puzzle of our faith today. Our curriculum, Faith Like a River, tells the story of universalism best, I think. Universal salvation, or universalism, is the theological belief that through the goodness, mercy, and love of God, all people will be saved, that is, all people will be forgiven of their sins and granted eternal life. The idea that all people would be saved is a very, very old one. It can be seen as early as the works of Origen, an important scholar and theologian of the early church. 
It also surfaces in Christian history, in the thought of theologians and faiths from the Roman Catholic Church to the radical arm of Protestant Reformation. However, for the most part, the doctrine of universal salvation stood as contrary to the teachings of most Christian churches. And when universalism did bubble up, it remained a theological idea rather than a formal or distinct church tradition. That is, until universalist ideas came to America, where at long last, universalism developed into a formal institution. There are different stories as to how this came about. The often recounted story is a favorite of mine about John Murray, a Methodist lay preacher from England. In England, Murray became converted to the idea of universal salvation by James Relly, author of the pamphlet Union. Following the death of his wife and infant son, Murray gave up on preaching and in 1770, immigrated to the United States. As the story is told, on the way to New York, Murray's ship became stuck in a sandbar off the coast of, New Jersey, coast of New Jersey at Good Luck Point. While waiting for the wind to ship, shift the ship off the bar, say that three times fast, Murray went ashore where he met the farmer, Thomas Potter. Potter is reported to have asked if Murray was the preacher sent by God to preach universal salvation in the meeting house that he had built for just that purpose. Murray declined, but Potter persisted. If, he said, the winds did not change by Sunday, it was a sign from God that Murray was meant to preach in the meeting house. If the winds did release the ship, Murray was free to continue his journey on to New York. Well, the wind stayed quiet. And so on Sunday, September 30th, Murray returned to the pulpit to preach universal salvation in Thomas Potter's meeting house. In the following years, Murray preached universalism along the East Coast of the United States and in 1779 founded the Independent Church of Christ now known as the Independent Christian Church Unitarian Universalist in Gloucester, Massachusetts, which is recognized as the very first Universalist Church in America. Finally, an institution dedicated to the Universalist ideas was founded. In 1805, Hosea Ballou published a Treatise on Atonement, perhaps the most influential universalist document of the 19th century. The book articulated an American understanding of universalism and the religion of universal salvation spoke to many in the youthful, optimistic nation. Because Ballou held that no soul was hellbound, whether by God's judgment or exclusion of election, his book represents the very first real break universalism had with Calvinism. Ballou was a preacher and a founder of the Universalist magazine in 1819, but is perhaps best remembered for his role in the restoration controversy of the 1820s. Ballou held the ultra-universalist view that all people were saved immediately upon death. Now, universalism grew rapidly in numbers as individuals left their former religious traditions, particularly the Baptist and Congregational faiths. By the time of the Civil War, there were, drum roll please, estimated to be more than 600,000 universalists in the United States. While attracted to the message of universal salvation, these come-outers from other faith traditions brought ideas that influenced the ways in which universalists organized themselves. Now, as we're going through history, universalism continued to develop theologically as well, and by the late 19th century, promoted higher criticism of the Bible. 
the need for universalism to establish a universal beloved community through social engagement and reconciliation between religion and science, particularly in light of the publication of Darwin's On the Origin of Species. In the 20th century, as, Unitarian, as universalism moved further from its Trinitarian Christian roots, the term universalism took on the meaning of a religion for all people rather than its original reference to the doctrine of universal salvation. Robert Cummins, the general superintendent of the Universalist Church of America, the UCA, succinctly declared in 1943, ours is a world fellowship. By the 1950s, universalism and Unitarianism theologically moved closer together. It became advantageous for the two denominations to become one. So, in 1961, the churches merged to become Unitarian Universalist. They took the theological ideas from both churches and created our seven, our principles, our eight principles. Today, our universalist heritage calls us to center those that are marginalized, lift voices not heard, move with justice in our hearts because each and every person is divine simply because they are a person. There's a, not a heart to win over or prove that they're worthy of love of a divine being. They are loved simply by being their own true selves and moving to make a world where everyone can be loved and celebrated. Universalism holds that each person is whole and beautiful and worthy of dignity and respect. Our intersectionality makes us stronger as people of faith. This week, move with love centered in your hearts and most importantly in your actions. Honor John Murray's call for a brave faith centered on love. Thank you for joining us for Reimagining Chapel. If you'd like to find out more information about the First Unitarian Church of Salt Lake City, please visit our website, slcuu.org. But until next time, let's heart out. Have a say.